What we'll be talking about tonight is kind of an excerpt of what we did at the discipleship retreat a few weeks ago. And so if you guys remember, if you were here, we announced that we have, we have a young adult discipleship retreat every year for the past four years, I believe. And um, the goal within that is to kind of be a, um, not necessarily an opposition with, but kind of a parallel or something opposite than what most young adults or most college age students are encouraged to do during their spring break trips. During their spring break trips, there's a lot of encouragement to go on different mission trips, to travel the world, to go, may it be throughout America, throughout the States, may it be overseas, may it be in Mexico, may it be in Canada. There's all these different things going on um, that people are encouraged to take part in. And so what we wanted to do um, to not necessarily fight against it, but basically to say, hey, we should have more of a mentality to go on mission. Because I think that not, necess- not, not to say that these, um, these foundations or these businesses or these groups that, that formulate these missions and put all these things together, they are not ill-intended, so it's not that. But I think that we have seen, seen within our culture shaped a mentality that if I go to Mexico for seven days and I'm good, I've shared the love of Jesus. It doesn't matter how I am in my classroom. It doesn't matter how I am at my school. It doesn't matter how I treat my family. It doesn't matter how I am in church uh, because I've done my good deed. I can check that off. I spent three grand to build a house in Mexico, so we're good. And that's, I know, actually, I know a lot of people who work on those mission boards and know a lot of those things, and so I know that's not their intent, but I think there has been this culture that has been shaped because of that, and Rika and Micah, uh, Rika and Micah, Ryan and Micah um, as well saw that about four or five years ago, and they said, how about we, instead of saying all of our students and our young adults should go, how about we say we have a week where we come together and we discuss what it means to disciple people, what it means to kind of, for lack of a better phrasing or to use the cultural phrasing, to live missionally. What does it mean to show the love of Christ to those within our families, within our schools, within our jobs, within our community? What does that mean? And so as we've approach every year. It's had that same core. It's just kind of been different lessons revolving around that. So this year, our theme was, it's not about me. And so if you recall, if you were here a few months ago, I know Micah and Ryan, we've tried to stress within our language a lot more that Jesus is core. You've heard a lot. If you were part of the youth group in the 90s, you probably saw the, like the I'm third or the I'm second movements and those types of things um, where Jesus is number one. And so we didn't necessarily want to be like, well, that's stupid or that's wrong. What we wanted to be like was, no, and instead of making a list of priorities, some sort of checklist, some sort of thing, what we should say is that Jesus is center, that Jesus is core. And so what that means is if Jesus is the core of our thought processes, is the core of our mind, is the core of our actions, then everything that we are flows from him, right? And what we understand from that as well is if Jesus is core, then ultimately it's not about us. It's not about, it's not about Pierce. It's about Jesus. It's about essentially what would Jesus do? I'm, I'm like killing it with these cliches tonight, just jumping out there. What would Jesus do? I'm second. What up? There's two. That's what I did tonight. That's all I've done. <laughs> so this, so basically with this discipleship retreat, what I wanted to do is look at application. And so what does it mean to, or what does it mean to apply this mentality that Jesus is core? Not necessarily mentality, but apply this reality that Jesus is core. And so within that, we talked about, it's not about me. It's not about Pierce. It's not about Hannah, it's not about Hayden, it's not about Joe, I keep going, but you know what I'm saying. So it's not about us as individuals, ultimately it's about Jesus. And so we talked about these different sections within there. We talked about firstly about salvation, that we in ourselves could not achieve salvation or reconciliation to God on our own, that only Christ could do that. So when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to our reconciliation, when it comes to our adoption into Christ, into God, we know that it's about Jesus, it's not about me. I couldn't do anything to earn God's favor. I was dwelling in sin. I was bound by this world. I was bound by death. And it was because of Christ's actions, because of Christ's works, that I can now be freed from those things, right? And so within salvation, within adoption, within redemption, it's not about Pierce. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. So secondly, what we're actually going to be talking about tonight in Ephesians 2 and a couple other places is about community. Community being the people of God. Um, us here and now, those people who gather together, who have been, who have placed our faith in Christ, who have been adopted, who have been redeemed, who have been changed by the gospel. That's our community. And so when it comes to interacting with with our community, it's not about what Pierce wants, what Pierce needs, what Pierce desires. It's not about what us as individuals desire or need, but rather it's about Jesus. And it's about acting as Jesus would act. And so we'll dive more and talk about that tonight. But then in our third section, was about discipleship specifically. And so the way I defined discipleship was essentially teaching people the ways of Jesus. 
So that could look like walking with someone who what our culture would deem as an unbeliever or would might be walking with somebody who just got baptized or we're walking along somebody who's been in the faith for 10 or 15 years. It's essentially teaching somebody about Jesus. Whenever I came under Mike and Ryan, I've been walking with Jesus for about five or six years at that point, but I would very much call myself being discipled under them. So I think that it's no matter what, it's kind of taking people under you and teaching people about Jesus. And so we talked about Paul's mentality within 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, how he talks about within their culture, there's this issue of meat sacrifice to idols. And without making that a whole nother sermon, um, basically the issue was within that culture, within that pagan culture, if you were to be seen partaking in meat sacrifice to idols, um, there is a, within the culture, you could be, in, the action could be interpreted as you worshiping that idol. And so Paul spends a while saying, hey, listen, we know, we of the faith know that, that idols are nothing, that this meat essentially isn't going anywhere, that, that there's, there's, no, there's no God but our God, and therefore this meat's completely fine to eat. We have the right and the freedom to eat these things, but my goal isn't my rights and my freedom. My goal is the gospel. My goal is Jesus. I do not strive to put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. What he is saying in that moment is, I would, that Paul himself would gladly sacrifice all of his rights and all his freedoms so that people would know the gospel. And so he talks within there, he says specifically weaker brothers, but he also talks about the lost within that chapter. And so when it comes to discipleship, it's not about us. It's not about what Pierce wants. It's not about what Katie wants. It's not about what Christy wants. It's about Jesus. That's right. You're involved now. <laughs> so like I said tonight, oh, and then our fourth section was about life, which ended up primarily being about Marriage. We talked a lot about marriage and we talked a lot about relationships. And when it comes to relationships, when it comes to Hannah and ours and Mars and mine, you know, everything that's going on in here, when Hannah's and my marriage, it's not about Pierce being right. It's not about me dominating over her and forcing her to be submissive. No, it's about Jesus. It's about, it's about these roles that, that God has created within marriage. And so within that, how do I act? I act as Jesus acted. And how did Jesus act? He he was a servant, he loved, he was sacrificial, he, he poured himself out for his people. And so, and we see Hannah uh, within our marriage uphold this, uh, the role, well, this is all in Ephesians 5, in case you guys, I don't want you guys to think I'm just pulling this out of my head. Um, in Ephesians 5, we see these very specific roles of marriage that um, Hannah would uphold the, the, the people of God. And so, it's this beautiful picture of the gospel painted within marriage. It's not about, it's not about either one of us being right. May it, like, I'm trying to think of any discussions we had we talked about all the nitpicky little things that you see in marriage. And in those moments, there's plenty of people that are like, I know I'm right. The toilet paper goes under. And they will fight like tooth and nail for that to see this way come true, to like make it happen within the household. Like you hear those people of like, oh, we're a Red Vines family. We are not a Twizzlers family. It's all these different little nitpicky type things, which, I mean, obviously there are little things that maybe shouldn't be. I'm just kidding. So all of that to be said, it's not about being... I'm about Pierce being right. Our marriage isn't about Pierce. Our marriage is about Jesus. And within that, how would Jesus act in that scenario? He would be humbling. He would be serving. He would be loving. He would be pouring out of himself. And so it's not about us. It's about Jesus. And so, like I said, we're in Ephesians 2 tonight. We are talking about community with this mindset of it's not about me. And just to be clear when I say that, it might get a little bit confusing when talking about community. I might interchange me and us, but what I'm talking about there primarily is individuals, kind of an individualistic mindset. Does that make sense? That can be confusing when we're talking about a group of people. Like if I were to say it's not about us, I'm like, well, that's the whole topic of tonight. That's confusing. But to make clear, whenever I say it's not about us or it's not about me, I'm talking about individualistic mindset, not us as a whole. Does that make sense? Does that breed some clarity? 2020 vision, bruh. Cool. We're in chapter two of Ephesians. Talk about what's going on in Ephesians. So I know we've, we've talked about it um, quite a bit, but I want to make extremely clear that we're all on the same page tonight. In Ephesians, Paul is primarily talking about the unity between Jews and Gentiles that Christ has accomplished. Um, this is a theme that we kind of see throughout a lot of the New Testament. The majority of the New Testament is Paul and the other apostles confronting either false gospels or, um, or a cultural or racial divide within the people of God. There's a lot of these interactions where they're having to correct people's mindsets. May it be with them succumbing to a false or a twisted gospel or them succumbing to cultural and racial divides. And so what Paul is doing in the midst and uh, talking to the, the church in Ephesus is he's proclaiming the truth of what Christ has accomplished. 
He's saying, listen, yeah, there, there was a reality that, that you two people groups were completely divided, that you and, as Jews and Gentiles were divided. But, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Actually, I'll read that for you guys. Um, but what he's talking about here is that through Christ, unity can be attained, that unity is given. And so we'll pick up in chapter two, verse 11. Therefore, remember formerly that you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called the uncircumcision, by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly, formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and make reconcile them both into one body to God through the cross by having, him, by having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. And so Jesus Christ, Jesus is the means of peace. Jesus is the means of unity. We see that because of the cross, because of his sacrifice, because of his resurrection, resurrection, he has accomplished a great deal, not only within us as individuals that we are now forgiven, that we are now reconciled, that we are now adopted, but because of that, because of that truth that reverberates throughout all of time and space, the fact that we have now become a people of God is within that truth, within that statement, we are in fact unified. We are unified. It's not like, hey, you know, you're now a Christian. You now said a prayer. You now did all these things. You know what? You may want to try to to make, make some new friends and be a part of a family. No, the fact of the matter is that we have been changed because of Jesus Christ. We who have placed our faith in Jesus have been forgiven. We have gone from death to life. And within that change, within from being, from being a child of the world, from being a child of wrath, from being a son or daughter of disobedience, to shifting to being a child of God, to shifting to being one who is holy, one who is pure, one who is righteous, that complete identity shift also includes within that that we are united to the people of God. Does that make sense? We are now unified. That is a resounding fact of who we are. We are completely brought together into one family. And to make that truth even stick a little bit more, we see in Chapter four, beginning in verse one. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope in your calling. There is one Lord and one faith and one baptism, one God of Father, of all who is over all and through all and in all. We are completely united within this one God. He says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with with which you've been called. Preserve the unity of the spirit. You've been given this unity now. Preserve it now. Walk in it now. Live in it. This is something you have. This is something you walk in. One thing that I love as well that he stresses here is peace, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Um, Let me kind of, peace. I lost it, I don't know what the verse is, but he talks about peace earlier in the chapter, talking about how peace was established within these two people groups, that in Christ there is peace. And so too often whenever I would read the scriptures with a very individualistic mindset, specifically focused upon Pierce and Pierce's motives, whenever I would see the word peace, I would I would make that, I would force that to be an interaction between myself and God. So I would see things like peace through Christ, and I would, I would make that, like, oh, okay, yeah, I have peace with God through Christ. And while that is a very true statement, what he's talking about here in these moments is that we now have peace. Specifically, obviously, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles, how these two people groups have peace with one another through Christ. 
And we can apply that here and now through our understanding of the unity that we have in Christ's blood, that we all have peace with one another. And he says, preserve that peace. He says, walk in that peace. He says, uphold that peace. We're going to be turning to Colossians 3, if you guys would like to go ahead and turn there. I know we haven't turned a whole bunch on Sundays recently, and so I just wanted to practice those two-page flips of foo, foo, to the right of to Colossians 3. That's where we'll be. So we'll talk more about peace here within Colossians. But to understand, to start with us and within a community, to talk about who we are in community, I think we must first establish the fact that we are a community, that we are united, that we are one people of God. And within that is a part of our identity of who we are. When I was contemplating as well, what I was going to preach on this week, um, Hannah was taking a nap and I watched Black Panther. Um, who's, seen, who's seen Marvel's Black Panther? Cool. Okay, so, so this L shape right here. So um, the majority of you guys, it's not spoilers, maybe. It's been out for a while. It's on Netflix. If you want to plug your ears or go to the back, I'm going to say just a little scene. That legit got me so worked up. Like, Hannah looked at me and she's like, you're going to cry? And I was like, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to. It's a superhero movie. I'm not going to cry. But I was this close. So what was happening was... Um, within the movie before this, or kind of chronologically, if you understand the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's chaos. Um, but there's a movie before this where you learn about the character Black Panther, and I cannot remember his name, his actual name, so I will be calling him Black Panther. Um, and so his father ends up getting killed, who is the king of Wakanda within Africa. And so we see and we learn the history of the people of Wakanda, right? Just give you a little overview of these five different tribes who came together and there was some kind of tiffs within history here and there. But overall, there was unity within these communities within Africa. And they have, um, what's the metal called? Anybody remember the metal? What was it? Vibranium. Vibranium was what kind of brought them together because it was this meteorite that came down, brought vibranium, all that sci-fi fun stuff. That's not important. All that to say they united around this and they said, what shall we do? I wish I could do a killer accent, like African accent without sounding like a jerk. I know I can't, so I'm not even going to try. I couldn't even do like, you know how Ryan will like switch to Scottish real quick. And what it is for me is it just sounds like a super duper backwoods West Texan trying to sound like somebody else. I like go into my natural accent and I'm like, oh, how are you doing? Um, all that to say, within Wakanda, the five tribes, right, united around vibranium. So they have, they, this king passes away and there is, there's turmoil, there's mourning. But what the tribes know is the fact that what this means is Black Panther, the prince, gets to become king. And they go on these boats, right? It's like the day where he's like initiated in as his king. And so they get on these boats and they're going down these river this river and they kind of cut off, they like block off the, the waterfalls so they can like climb into the waterfall where it's kind of trickling and stuff. And as they're going, they're doing like these dope dances and they're singing and they're like, just this really cool, like very tribal music. And like as they're going there, you can tell they're driven with this one purpose and this one joy, which is this, this the king is going to be instated. Like, and as cheesy as it sounds, the whole time I was like, you know, Jesus, I, like, I felt like the 1993 Sunday school vibes kind of coming out of me and being like, what an illustration. Like, just loving this so much, but the fact that there was, there was this unity and there was this passion as they came together um, to begin this initiation process, they had, had him come out and that all of the tribes agreed, this is the true king, this is the good king. And it was so great to see just, just this complete unification because we don't have a lot of, our, we don't see a lot of very tribal mindsets here within America. One of the great things about America is that we're the great melting pot, that there are people from all places and all backgrounds that come together that can work together and all of those things. And so we can see a different picture of unity there. But there's something about looking at these different tribes throughout the world, especially through sci-fi fake movies for some reason, where I can look at these things and be like, wow, these people are coming together intent with one purpose. These people know and understand that they are Wakandan. They are one people coming together with one purpose and rejoicing within that one purpose, that this is the one king. And within that, these five different tribes, four of them are able to come up and challenge the king. And they have this point where they say, you know what? We're not going to challenge him. Hey, you know what? And he goes the next one. We're not going to challenge him. Eventually he gets challenged because obviously there needs to be conflict within the movie. But he ends, you end up seeing kind of these four good tribes being like, we're not challenging. We're not doing that. Why? 
because this is the true king. This is the king who comes over. And within that, I was like, oh, gosh. Just like one single tear going down, you know, and I have a beard, so it only travels about one inch down before you know it just disappears, and so it just moisturizes my skin down there. It's all good. And I was like, man, unity in Jesus. The fact of the matter is that we can look at a very, a very worldly example of unity, a very, a very something that, that happens every day, day in and day out. May it, be, may it be through different tribes. May it be through family reunions. May it be through the birth of a child. These, these different points of coming together for one purpose, coming together in love and coming together in unity. We can see these things happen all throughout the world, day in and day out. But the fact of the matter is the God of the universe stepped down and united a people who could never be united. He stepped down as the true good king and took on sin, took on death, and brought together a people in forgiveness, in truth, and in love, and made them holy, made them right before him, reconciled them, and gave them a purpose, gave them a mind that could be unified in him. And that is amazing. We serve a mighty, good, and true God. in Colossians 3. I love the book of Colossians. I won't read the whole thing to you tonight. I'm not as good of a reader as Ryan is. I'm still on a third grade level. Um, We're on, thank you, forever triple over there. That's a joke. It's fourth grade. Um, Chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ appears, who is your life, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed in the true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarians, excuse me, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free men, but Christ is all and in all. Let's pause for a moment here on verse 11, a reiteration of the fact that those of us who are in Christ, the world's identity that we are given no longer defines us. Obviously, there are There is a truth to say that we are American, that we are Texan, that I am a part of the love family and those types of things while we're here on this earth. But ultimately, God's definition and God's um, identity now that we have in him remains true, that those of us who have been saved by Christ, those of us who put our faith in Christ, those of us who have been renewed, who have put off the old self and have put on the new self, we've been renewed in such a way in which there is no distinction that here and now there's no longer Greek or Jew, uncircumcised, cir- circumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. Just to reiterate again, the fact that we are a community isn't because we all walk through the same door, isn't because we all submit to the same teaching, isn't because we all live in San Angelo. The reason, because we, the reason why we are united is because of Jesus Christ. And in him there is no distinction. In him, in this room, we are all saved by the same blood of Christ. And within that, none of us are lesser than one another and none of us are better than one another. We are all united and equal within Christ. Why? Because it's Jesus. It's not about our works. It's not about our glory. It's not about us as individuals, but it's about Jesus and what he has accomplished. There is no division. There is no distinction between these different people groups, but rather Christ is our unifier. Christ is our identifier and Christ is who we are. Pick up with me in verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. That the word of Christ dwell richly within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 
Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. In this section right here, he begins to talk about our actions and our um, walking alongside the people of God and what does that look like and what does that mean? What does that mean for us in regards to application within the truth of who we are in Jesus? And so he starts the whole thing off by establishing that. Those of us who, who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of passion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgiving one another. Whoever has complaints against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so should you. And so what's incredibly beautiful in regards to this call of action, in regards to this call of application, is that he connects our very actions to our Savior himself, Jesus Christ. Those of us who have, who have placed our faith in Christ, those of us who acknowledge Christ as Savior, those of us who follow after him, we know what we've been forgiven from. We know the depth and the darkness and the condemnation, whether or not you were two years old when you placed your faith in Christ or whether or not you were 50 years old when you placed your faith in Christ. There's still an understanding of a separation from God because of sin. We've been forgiven much. The fact of the matter is that our identity before Christ was riddled with death, with sin, with condemnation, with this world. We were separated from God, cut off from the ways of God. And it is because of this forgiveness that we are now brought in and we are now reconciled, right? And so we can say, based off this forgiveness, that we have been forgiven much. And did we earn that forgiveness? Was it through Pierce's actions that God said, you know what, yeah, you're cool, I'll forgive you, bless you, you're welcome. See, it's not about me. <laughs> What? No, thank you, Christy. It wasn't by our own actions that we earned the forgiveness of God, but God forgives freely through his son, Jesus Christ. Those are two examples of the forgiveness of Christ. Obviously, we could probably go on about forgiveness for a long time, but those are two examples about the forgiveness of Christ Jesus, right? He forgives much, very much, and he forgives openly and freely, right? We as a people of God who congregate and come together as a people of God who are united by the truth of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished in us as his people, forgive as he forgives. And how does that, what does that look like? It looks like much. We forgive a lot. He kind of, he had this discussion with his disciples, right? His disciples were like, okay, so we forgive like seven times? And Jesus is like, no, 70 times seven. And that number is so crazy the disciples' heads exploded because they didn't understand how to forgive somebody 490 times. They were done. They're like, what? But we understand, obviously, what he's doing is he's throwing a number out there that's like, like, forgive much. Why? Because we've been forgiven much. Christ, what's so beautiful about our king, what's so beautiful about our savior is that he calls us to walk as he has walked. He doesn't say, okay, now you're all good, but you know what? Go do a bunch of things that I never cared to do. What he says is he says, hey, you're my people, walk as I've walked. Hey, hey, don't worry. It may be hard to forgive that person, but you know and you've experienced forgiveness because of me. You've known, you've known and you experienced forgiveness, you've been forgiven much, so therefore, it's not crazy to forgive much. You know what stands in the way of forgiving? Us, individuals, me, pride. When it comes to forgiving, it's not about Pierce being right. It's about Jesus. It's about the fact that he has forgiven. You know who was the most right? Jesus. You know who forgave the most? Jesus. We follow after Jesus. You know what's crazy? Is that sounds so nuts to the world because the world proclaims, you do you. No, 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 if you're not happy, you get out. You do everything about you, you pursue your own happiness, and you have to be right in all scenarios. And if nobody acknowledges you as right, you're a beautiful, free, independent white woman, and so you gotta get out of there, right? That's what people used to call me in college. You uphold your own happiness, right? And that's what makes us so vastly different from the world, because you know what looks crazy? Looking at looking someone who in, the, who in the eye, who just harmed you, who just lied to you, who just betrayed your trust, looking at them as a brother or sister in Christ and saying, I forgive you. 
I had several friends in college who blatantly and openly lied to my face. And you know what I, you know what I did? I actually went home and ranted to my mother and was just like, how dare my friends? Like, how dare they do these things? And you know what? That, that was at the center of those conversations. But going back in, the, in time and looking at that, you know what made that whole situation hard by looking them in the face and saying, I forgive you, or even apologizing for my own pride. What made that situation hard was still my pride. I was still standing in the way and the false teachings of this world were standing in the way because I was making it all about me and my happiness and my comfortability instead of about Jesus. Because you know what a, 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 a hurting brother or sister who just fell into the ways of this world or turned to sin instead of turning to Jesus, you know what they need? A loving brother or sister who looks them in the eyes and says, you are forgiven. Now, come on, let's walk in the ways of Jesus. You don't need to walk in the ways of the world. You know what they don't need? People turning their back on them and saying, hey, you earn my forgiveness. That has tainted the ways of the people of God for way too long. We forgive as Jesus forgives, much and openly. And here he says, love, in verse 14, beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. How do we know love? We know love because Jesus has loved. We see in First John that um, we, know, we know and understand love because he first loved us. Jesus showed us what it meant to be sacrificial. Jesus showed us what it meant to be humble, which we'll talk about more in a second. Jesus know, showed us what it meant to make life about others and not about himself. He showed us what it meant to have a life dedicated to the ways of God, Verse 15, again, peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and be thankful. The peace of Christ. And what he's talking about here, there is instances where we have peace with God. We see in Philippians that the peace of Christ is overwhelming, the peace that we have with God, the peace and contentment that we have. But right here, he's talking about the peace that we have with each other. We've been called together to one body. We haven't been called to two bodies, to some of you guys being over here and some of you guys being over here. Rather, we've been called to one body. I didn't actually mean to make the pews a symbol, a symbol, but I did make it a symbol, so you're welcome. There's the accent for the night, the one you get. We've been called to one body. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The peace that we have with one another is not based off of our own actions. It's rather based off of the truth of what Christ has already accomplished, the peace of Christ that we have with one another. When it comes to us being peaceful with each other, it's not about Christ, or excuse me, it's not about us, but it's about Jesus. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell richly within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. When it comes to our wisdom, it is not of our own, but it is of Christ. We utilize the wisdom given to us from Christ to teach and, 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 and excuse me, encourage one another as they admonish Teach and admonish one another, to encourage one another. We point to the ways of God. It's not about, it's not about Pierce being right. That's one thing that I've, that I've loved so much about our community. I know I've stressed it a few times, but whenever I first started coming here, not even on staff, not even a pastor, but when it's just when I first started coming here, looking at Ryan and Micah as being so willing to say, hey, I was wrong. I taught that passage to you guys last week or last month or last year wrong. Really what it was is the first year that I had come on was you've probably heard of the, uh, the atonement series where we kind of, we began to kind of shape our mentality of what Christ accomplished or how Christ accomplished atonement on the cross. And it, was in, and it was incredibly encouraging to see someone get behind a microphone, get up on stage, behind a guitar, whatever you want to see, and look out at the crowd and say, I was wrong. Do you know what you don't see very often? People in authority, quote unquote authority, getting up and saying, hey, I was wrong. You know what you do see, though? Men and women dedicated to the ways of God and acknowledging that the ways of God and the word of God are higher than their own ways and saying, you know what? I got it wrong because that doesn't undermine us because we don't care about us as individuals. We care about Jesus. We make much of the ways of Jesus. So if we, if we misunderstand the ways of Jesus or, or we teach incorrectly the word of God, you know what me means more than that moment? The word of God. Not Pierce's pride or Pierce's reputation, but the word of God. So the wisdom of Christ is what, what, what dwells within our teaching, which encourages, strives us, pushes us to encourage one another. And so may it be within forgiveness, may it be within our peace with one another, or may it be with how we teach and encourage and build up one another. It's not about us, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. If you would turn with me one last time to Philippians 2, so we're going back to the left. This community that we have, 
is such a brilliantly beautiful thing because it's not up to us. This world is broken. This world is, is dying. This world is chaotic. And you leave things up to, to humans, it might look really good for a while. It might even smell really good for a while. But most of the time, it doesn't last. Most of the time, there's a kink in the work. Remember earlier talking about Black Panther, I said a conflict had to happen. It's because that's a lot of the ways that we understand the world is that, well, this, this may all be good and roses, but where's the conflict? When's that going to happen? And what's so incredible about this community that we have is it's not that we, we enter into salvation because of Jesus and we push the things of Jesus aside and now we must further the ways of ourself, but rather we acknowledge the ways of Jesus, ignore ourself completely and say, hey, you know what? Just by me acknowledging him and placing my faith and walking after him, I have said to him and the world that it's not about me. So why in the world would we stop that mindset at the door there and then walk into a room full of the people of God and say, you know what, but in this room, it's all about me. When it comes to the ways of Jesus, sure, yeah, when it comes to salvation, it wasn't about me. I needed him to help me out, but I don't need his help anymore. I'm over here now. That's not what it means for Jesus to be core. That's not what it means to live a life dedicated to Jesus. That's not what it means for Jesus to be Lord Jesus is the good king and Jesus reigns over all things and he is the one who has changed us and has united us. And you know what's so beautiful? It's the fact that I can look every single one of you in the eyes and say you are forgiven, not based off of me, but based off of the word and the truth of God. And that's beautiful. That we have become vessels of God's love. That we have become ways by which we, we shine light to each other and encourage one another by his power, by his goodness, because he's the one who has changed us and who has molded us. We're in Philippians chapter two, starting in verse one. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship in the spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men." Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and those on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In verse one, he says, therefore, he very basically says, therefore, if you've been changed by the gospel. Therefore, if Jesus Christ has changed you and affected you, what he says is there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, there's any fellowship of the spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, those of us who are in Christ should be like, oh yes, we got encouragement in Christ. Oh yes, there's love. Oh yes, there's fellowship in the spirit. We've had the Holy Spirit poured out upon us. Oh yes, there are these things. If there's any affection and compassion, yeah, there is. And then Paul's like, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. If you've been affected by the gospel, if you've been changed by Jesus, if you follow after Jesus, Paul is saying, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintain the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Verse three, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regards, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And then in verse five, he says, have this attitude among yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. And when I would approach the text, especially the books of Paul when I was younger, I would get to these miniature rants that he would have about the gospel and I would dissociate them with everything he just said. Because it would seem like he would be like, oh, by the way, Jesus. And then just one, like, it's just time to talk about Jesus. And it would seem so detached 
from what he's actually saying. But as I began to approach the scripture with a mindset of context, it's a mindset of consistency, you see here this beautiful picture of what he's saying. He says, hey, be humble with each other. Have a mindset of humility. Don't necessarily seek out your own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind that this attitude within yourself is also in Christ Jesus. And then he discusses Christ's humility. So he says, hey, by the way, be humble and do it the way Jesus did. How do we know that Jesus was humble? Well, Jesus was God. Jesus was in the very form of God. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be reached for, a thing to be strived for, but rather he was God. And being God, he stepped down and put on the form of a servant, even looking like a man. He became a man. I like that he has to clarify. You're putting on the form of a servant, being in the appearance of man. And being in the appearance of man, he walked as a servant. He walked being humble. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God himself stepped down and became man. And men are just the worst. Man, obviously he wasn't, Jesus wasn't, but like he looked like one of the worst. Like, man, we are the ones, man, humankind, I should say, humans are the ones that turned their back on God. Humans are the ones that said, hey, my, my pride, my desires, my things are more important than your ways. Humans are the ones who said, hey, you know what? You may have taught me one thing that's good, but I want that apple and that other apple, that fruit, whatever you want us to put into there, that fruit, and that looks better than obeying right now. That's what humans have done. We are the ones who are tainted with sin. We are the ones who are tainted with death. We are, the, we are the parts of creation who have disobeyed God and turned and walked away from him. Jesus stepped down from being God, stepped down and put on the form of a servant, looking like men, looking like the ones who have disagreed, who have disobeyed, who have turned their backs on. Obviously, we know, don't misunderstand me. We know that Jesus didn't disobey. We know that Jesus walked in obedience. Don't misunderstand me. Jesus looked like these people who have. One thing that I love, it's so beautiful in Hebrews chapter two, is the fact, (coughs) excuse me. He says, he's talking about our, our high priest that we have in Jesus and how great of a high priest it is because we have a high priest who not only can forgive our sins, but has walked in the, in the temptation and walked in the ways that we have walked. We have a high priest who sympathizes with us, who empathizes with us, who has, who has gone through the ways of this world, who's been tempted in the same way that we've been tempted and he has overcome these things. Jesus stepped down, putting on the form of a servant. How do we be humble with each other? How do we put the interests of others above ourselves? In light of Jesus doing that. In light of Jesus' humility. Again, this isn't some contest between us and Jesus. Rather, this is the good king, the good servant, the good shepherd setting up a model for us to walk in. Saying, hey, follow after me, Be humble. I'm not making you be humble just for the sake of being humble. I'm making you be, I'm not making you, I'm asking you to be humble because I was humble. Because these are the ways of God. These are the ways of truth. These are the ways of walking together in community. So in regards to community in general with us being brothers and sisters, it's not about us. It's not about us as individuals. It's about Jesus. We do these things in light of what Jesus has already accomplished. We do these things in light of who he is. We do these things in light of the gospel. We walk in these ways because we long to walk as Jesus has walked, right? I love the fact that we have, that we have this, that we can look at one another and serve one another, but also be encouraged by one another that we can also walk through life with one another, that we can walk through these ways together, that, that in the midst of this, it's not just focusing on myself. How do, I, how do I uphold this peace? How do I uphold this unity? How do I uphold all these things? But rather, it's, it's living in these ways because we've been shown them in the ways of Jesus and we've been shown them as well with the people around us. 
We're able to look at each other's humility. We're able to look at each other being a servant. We're able to look at each other growing and learning and lean into each other. We're able to ask help from one another because it's not, it's not oh, I don't want to be weak because in that moment, we're making it about us again. If I say, hey, I need help or I need help understanding to a brother or sister in Christ, the core of that conversation is still Jesus. And if your brother or sister looks at you and condemns you, they're not looking at you through the, through the lens of Jesus. They're looking at you through the lens of this world, and that's not your fault. We should always be able to look at our brothers and sisters in the eye and be servants to one another and build up one another and encourage one another. We no longer look with condemnation, but we look with forgiveness. We no longer have disorder, but we have peace. And so therefore, since that is the core, since that is the goal, since that is the means of an end, it is nothing for me to look at somebody and say, I don't get it. Help me out. I don't know this. I shouldn't expect them to condemn me or tear me down or belittle me or gossip about me, but I should expect my brother or sister to grab me around the shoulders, pull me up, and encourage me in the midst of Christ. That's what we should expect from one another because the goal is Christ. The goal is always Christ. The goal isn't ourself. The goal isn't our reputation. The goal isn't our pride. The goal is Christ. And we see that time and time again throughout all these examples of communities within the New Testament. We see God exemplified because we know and understand what Christ has accomplished. We know and understand what he has done. We know and we understand who he is. Let's spend some time in prayer. Father God, you are good and you are mighty, Lord. You have looked at us and you have proclaimed us as people who are forgiven. You've made us a people who are righteous You have made us a people who are pure and you have reset the desires of our heart to no longer be on the things of this world or the ways of this world, but to be on your ways, to be focused on who you are, Lord God. You have transformed our mind, you have transformed our hearts and we, we long to walk in your ways. Why? Because the ways of this world are filled with death, they're filled with nothing, they're filled with condemnation, but the ways of you are filled with righteousness, purity and holiness and love and truth. So Jesus, may we be a people united under your banner. May we be a people united in your gospel. May we be a people united because of how you've changed us. May we walk in that. May we walk in that reality and be forgiving and be peaceful. Be those who would encourage and who would teach and who would guide. Be those who are humble. Why? It's no longer about us as individuals, Lord Jesus, but it's about you. You are the good king, the rightful king. And we praise you in all things, Lord Jesus. It's in your most precious and holy name that I pray, amen.